welcome to Rust Guides. Today, we're going to take a comprehensive look at plant genetics and crossbreeding. This is a follow-up from my previous video where I covered the basics of setting up a starter hemp base, so please check that out if you haven't already. Link is in the description box below. This video will be broken up into seven key areas. Genetics explained, genes, conditions, plant life cycle, cloning, crossbreeding, and optimizations. I'll try and break down each of these sections as best I can. There's two great Reddit posts which I've linked below that not only helped me out massively making this video, but also helped me learn plant genetics. So a shout out to Manajaka and Autovox, hopefully I've pronounced these names correctly. Let's get into it. In a nutshell, plant genetics impact the growth rate, yield and overall success of your plants. Good genetics can result in increased growth rates and shave a third off a plant's life cycle. Not only that, it can also double the production output. Whereas bad genetics can hinder your plant production or stop it altogether in some scenarios, like water exhaustion. The genetics of your plants is a combination of five possible genes, and each plant has six genes. So let's take a look at genes. Genes are broken up into two core categories. The positive genes, which are coloured green, and the negative genes, which are coloured red. Whether a gene is positive or negative will impact the crossbreeding calculations, but we'll come back to this in crossbreeding. Let's start by taking a look at the positive genes. The first is Y, or yield. As you may have already figured out, the more Y genes you have, the more of that plant you will receive when you harvest it. Next is G, or growth. This speeds up the plant's life cycle. And from my tests, for each G you have, you should see an approximate reduction of time by 5%. And the final good gene is H, or hardiness. This indicates how resilient a plant is to its surroundings. Basically, this will cause a plant in poor ground quality, cold temperatures or limited water saturation to develop easier. Now, onto the negative genes. The first is W, or water. This is the bad one. This increases the water intake of your plant, so if you have too many of these, it might impact all the plants in your planter. And finally, X, or null slash empty. This is just a non-existent stat. As you've probably guessed, the best stats are Y and G, but you're probably asking, in what weighting? Well, we'll come on to that when we look at optimizations. For now, let's take a look at conditions. You'll be able to see your plant score on conditions if you move your crosshair over it. Simply put, the better the conditions, the faster it will flourish. There's four parts to conditions, light, water saturation, ground, and temperature. Light and water are pretty obvious, especially if you understand the basics of photosynthesis. Essentially, you need to provide your plant with sufficient light and water. Light can either come from a natural source like the sun, or an artificial source like a ceiling light. In rust, a continuous source of light speeds up the growth of your plants, so using ceiling lights is definitely the most optimal path. Water, similar to real life, needs a balance to be optimal, as just like in real life, too much water can have a negative effect on plants. So to give you the best chance, the most optimal water level of a planter should be between 65% and 75% capacity. Ground reflects the surface quality in which you plant your seeds into, so for planters, it has little impact compared to say something like sand or snow. To get your ground to 100%, you will need to use fertilizer, which can be obtained from composting. I may do a tutorial on this soon. Finally, temperature, which is dependent on which biome you planted your seeds in. The biggest impact to this is the cold, but this can be rectified with heaters. Let's take a look at the plant's life cycle. The plant life cycle has eight stages, and I'll break down the duration of these based roughly off a plant with no additional growth genes and a 67% overall condition which should last between eight and nine hours. It all starts with a seed. 
This stage is one of the shortest stages and lasts approximately 2 minutes, with no key events happening. From there, it moves on to the seedling stage. This lasts a little longer at approximately 15 minutes and once again, no key events. Now we move on to the sapling stage. This stage lasts again approximately 15 minutes and is important for crossbreeding. This is the stage where we plant our clones to be crossbred. This way we ensure what we plant are the dominant plants. If we place the clones at the same time as the seed to be crossbred, the seed could be slower to reach crossbreeding, and therefore when the clones hit the crossbreeding stage, they themselves will be crossbred and not the seed. It's also worth noting that you can harvest plants at this point to take clones. Now we move on to the important stage, crossbreeding. This stage only lasts approximately 2 minutes, similar to the seed stage and as I've already alluded to, will crossbreed with nearby plants replacing its own genetics. We'll go into more detail with this in the crossbreeding section. Next is mature. This lasts approximately an hour and a half and is typically at the point where the plant will be fully grown to harvest, but this won't give us the best yield. Now we move into the fruiting stage which lasts approximately 45 minutes. This is the stage where the plant will reach its optimal yield and at the end of this stage it's ready to harvest. The last good stage is the ripe stage. This lasts a whopping 4 hours. You won't gain anything at this stage, it is just used as an opportunity for you to collect your farm. Finally it will move on to the dying stage which will last an hour and a half while your crop decays before it's finally dead. Now let's take a look at cloning. Cloning is essentially the process of extracting plant genetics. It can be done at most stages of the life cycle and achieved by holding down your action button and selecting take clone. It's important to have a variety of clones if you plan to have multiple generations when crossbreeding. If you want to clone a clone, this can be easily done by placing a clone into a planter with no neighbouring plants e.g. the four corners of a large planter, then waiting until the plant becomes a sapling to harvest more clones. Obviously you could just fill the planter, but if you're cloning a variety of clones and you don't get back in time before the crossbreeding stage, you'll now have a jumbled up set of clones. Alternatively, you could play the look of the draw and keep trying to get the perfect clone without crossbreeding at all, but this is extremely time consuming and has a really low chance. So typically, you'll get what you want faster with crossbreeding, so let's look at this with more detail. Now this is probably why most of you are here, as crossbreeding can be quite confusing, but I'll try and make it as simple and as clear as possible. For all my examples, I'll be using a large planter, but this is entirely possible to do in a small planter and out in the wild. The way that crossbreeding works is when a plant is in the crossbreeding stage, it will look at all the genes of its neighbouring plants. Neighbouring plants include any plants that are one square away. This includes diagonally. It will replace all of its own genes to those with the highest accumulated weightings in the corresponding columns from the neighbouring plants. Before we looked at negative and positive genes. As I've already stated, negative genes are dominant, as they have the highest weighting, somewhere between 0.6 and 1. Some believe that the weightings of a negative gene is 0.6, but from my tests I've concluded that it's actually higher, and somewhere around 0.9. The positive genes have a weighting of approximately 0.5, so if you want to prevent a negative gene from being crossbred, you'll need to have two or more of the same type of positive gene to dominate it. Let's have a look at a simple example. And for now we'll say positive genes have a weighting of 0.5 and negative genes have a weighting of 0.9. Here we have a plant in the middle which is in the crossbreeding stage. Surrounding it is three plants and therefore we get three sets of genes. Let's have a look at how they look in a table. This is much easier to see than in game. Now let's give our genes the weightings we outlined. Now it's a case of going column by column and adding up each gene of the same type to understand which gene has the strongest dominance and therefore is the new gene to be crossbred. We'll start with the first column, which is actually a great example. As no gene has dominance, 
a gene will be picked at random from the possible choices. The same happens with the negative genes. For now, we'll just randomly pick G to simplify it. Now let's look at the next column. We can see there are multiple W genes, so these get grouped together. And now W has a weighting of 1.8. So this is now the dominant gene for this column and will be the new gene for column two. On to the next column. Again, we have two matching genes. This time, it's a positive G. This gives G a weighting of one, which outweighs the W gene, and gives us a G for the third column. Now let's look at column four. Again, we're seeing a group of positive genes, this time it's Y. As they're grouped together, it will give Y a weighting of one which outweighs the negative gene X of 0.9 and column four is a Y gene. Moving on to the fifth column, we see the same pattern, two H genes. Again, this is the dominant gene, so column five is a H gene. With column six, there is no duplicate genes, but as you can see, X has a weighting of 0.9 and therefore is the dominant gene over both Y and H, so column six is an X gene. And there we have it, our new genetic structure. GW, GY, HX. It's far from an ideal gene, but the next step would be to improve it by crossbreeding it again with another generation. Now in reality, this isn't a great genetic structure and I would typically just scrap it. If I did want to carry on though, I'd be looking at replacing the two X's and the H genes. To create a new generation, I'd first have to take a clone of our newly crossbred plant. And with our new clone, we can look at crossbreeding this further. This was just more of a simple example just to help you understand how crossbreeding works. I hope I explained that as clearly as possible, as it can be quite confusing at first. This isn't an easy process and will require a few attempts before you get it right. It's probably a good idea to set up a private server, and I'll leave a link in the description box below on how to do that. Once you've set up your private server, you can execute the following commands from the admin console to speed up the plant growth life cycles to test crossbreeding easier. The first command is plant tick. This is how often the plant tick happens in seconds. The minimum value is 10 seconds, so I'd advise setting it as 10. The second is plant tick scale. This is a multiplier for the plant tick. Setting this to 60 and the plant tick to 10 will cause your plants to grow one minute for every one second that passes. That should be everything to get you up and going with testing. Now let's take a look at optimizations. Now there's no perfect genes for all scenarios, but I can point you at the best possible outcomes for the type of farmer you are. For the more active farmers, you ideally want to farm with the genes 2Ys and 4Gs. This should yield around 585 cloth per large planter approximately every two hours. For less active farmers, you should try and aim for a higher yield, so 4Ys and 2Gs. This should yield around 675 cloth per large planter approximately every two and a half hours. And for the really lazy farmers, aim for about 6Ys which should net you approximately 720 cloth per large planter every three hours. I think that should have covered everything. I'm sure I've probably missed something though. If you pick up on anything I might have missed, please leave it in the comments box down below or any opinions or feedback you have for me. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please leave a thumbs up. And if you would like to keep up to date with any more of my content, please don't forget to subscribe.